forefront. Thank you. The topic of her second talk is the forefront of modern river restoration, stage zero and the natural wood regime. So let's find out about stage zero. Hey, thank you. you. You recognize these photos from the end of the last talk. So this is our continuity. And this is a PowerPoint um, pre-set design template. So I liked it, but I figure river restoration is not black and white. So it's going to be gray background for the rest of it. So two parts here. I'm going to talk a little bit about the science of river restoration and then a little bit about the practice. And there's a, some overlap here. So the science is three key points I want to make. The idea of legacies, we talked about alternative states, or I did uh, earlier, return to that idea of process domains, and then natural regimes of water, sediment, and wood. So legacies, I'm using it here in a very specific context. You know, legacy can mean a lot of things, but I am using it to refer to persistent changes that result from things we have done. And the key here is that those activities of humans that can influence river corridor process and form may no longer be occurring and people, the society in the uh, current location may have completely forgotten that they ever did occur. And I'll show you a specific example of that. Um, get this to go, there we go. So legacies can occur in at least a couple different ways. Indirect alterations, as it says here, are outside of the river corridor. So if we change the land cover, if we change topography, we are changing climate, we're changing the water sediment, and in some cases, large wood inputs to the channel in ways that are not always obvious, but they can be very important and influential. And then the ones that are more obvious are the things we do in the river corridor. So flow regulation, channelization, levees, exotic, species, whether they're aquatic or um, riparian, et cetera. Those were more likely to be aware of, particularly if they've occurred recently. But the key to all of these, and this is something I mentioned in the earlier talk, I now always start from the assumption that something has been changed in the watershed I'm working in or the specific river corridor, because that's almost always the case, certainly in the continental US. And there's a, so there's a long history in some parts of the world that goes back thousands of years, parts of Europe and Asia, the intensive human alteration of river corridors goes back well over a thousand years. In the US, it's more likely for intensive alteration to be centuries. But again, assume that is a default to, because it is very ubiquitous. And the key that I wanna make or the key point in the context of river restoration is that if we are not aware of that legacy of historical activities, we may have uh, different perceptions and expectations for river restoration than we would have otherwise. And as an example of this, this is about an hour from my house. This is Rocky Mountain National Park. This is a very well photographed or frequently photographed site. You look up towards the Continental Divide along the Big Thompson River, it's beautiful, but that's a really altered river corridor. Uh, 30 years ago, this was a very dense willow car. So a wet, woody sh uh, shrub environment, multiple channels, a lot of beavers here. In the last three decades, it's changed completely. And there's some sort of abused willow remnants here. And it's a fairly dry meadow. And again, that's the, the story that I alluded to earlier with very heavy riparian browsing by elk. But if you come into an environment like this, and you don't know anything about that history, that looks like a beautiful stream. And it looks like it's really healthy. It's in a national park, right? So it should be pristine. I think that's often the assumption. So I want to go briefly through three examples of historical legacies. Mill dams, uh, the, the sort of, these were in many places in the eastern half of the US, including from what I understand here in Wisconsin. But the, the classic study was done just over, or no, um, yeah, just over a decade ago in the mid-Atlantic Piedmont. And they were looking at streams that look like this. So this is all what's called now legacy sediment. It's sediment that came into the river corridors during European clearing of the uplands for agriculture. And if you see this dark layer, uh, 
that's the pre-settlement alluvium. That's the original valley floor. And prior to this work on mill dams, people looked at this and they said, well, you know, we've obviously got a sediment problem from the eroding stream banks. So what we need to do is try and stabilize those banks, preserve the, these are often gravel bedded streams and plant riparian forest here of say hardwood species. And that was the target and sort of the ideal goal for river restoration. Walter and Meritz published a paper in Science in 2008 where they looked at the stratigraphy in detail and they looked at what was in this pre-settlement layer. What they found were plant macrofossils that indicated wetland plants, so more like a, a sedge marsh environment. And they also found evidence for those multi-channel systems that I was talking about this morning. So anastomosing channels, fairly low gradient, individual channels branch and rejoin. And they started saying, you know, we should be thinking about restoring to those systems. And there was a huge amount of pushback. I mean, really almost personal attacks on them in many cases by other scientists who said, no, that, that, you know, that's an anomaly. That's not what we should have as our restoration goal. And a lot of this was driven by concerns about sediment and nutrients going into Chesapeake Bay. So it's clear that the eroding stream banks are the source of a lot of those sediment and nutrients but the stream banks are eroding because they're old mill pond sediment. The, the mill ponds, the mill dams are long gone and people had forgotten that there was such a high density of mill ponds, but there are historic maps that show these and there were literally thousands of mill ponds in, this, in some of these counties in Pennsylvania. They were very dense. The pond from one mill dam would back up to the base of the next mill dam upstream. So it was a series of ponds and drops so this is an example of the restoration that was done just upstream on this site. This is called Big Spring Run. They've got a very nice story map online. They lowered the entire floodplain. So if you have a scenario like this where the channel is hydrologically disconnected from the floodplain, you basically have two options. You can raise the channel or create obstructions that cause the flow to go over bank, or you can take the whole floodplain down. So here they removed the legacy sediment they initially uh, created just weekly, sort of a weak template for a multi-thread system. And then they let that system evolve and they planted willows and wetland herbaceous species, rushes, sedges, and now they're letting it evolve. And it's a very well-monitored system. This is a collaborative project where the USGS and state agencies and universities are watching what happens in terms of macroinvertebrates, fish, water quality, uh, vegetation, biomass, and diversity. So again, it's, it's a nice story map if you're interested in that one. It's called Big Spring Run. Second example, large wood in the Pacific Northwest. So Google Earth view of the Snohomish. Notice the very uniform channel with uh, obviously stabilized banks. There's a, a really nice body of work that shows where you pull all the wood out uh, and that can be pulling it from the channel and having intensive timber harvest you lose the log jams that create obstructions and facilitate a multi-channel system, even in these high energy gravel to cobble bed rivers. If the wood is still there, then you have something that looks more like this. This is the Queets River in Olympic National Park. And if we zoom in on that, or maybe we won't, let's see. Um, there we go. If we zoom in on it, you can see, oh. <laughs> Okay, there's a delayed response. Here we go. Uh, you can see there's a lot more diversity of the floodplain. Obviously, the channel is, once again, a lot messier, a lot more spatial heterogeneity, and that translates to greater um, habitat mosaic patches, abundance and diversity in the floodplain, diversity of floodplain vegetation, age and community composition, and certainly more diverse habitats in the channel. And Brian Collins and others at the University of Washington, this is one of the several papers they've had come out where they've looked at the Puget Lowlands and compared channels that have no history of timber management and wood removal versus those that have. And they're not, in many cases, they're, they're not harvesting um, forest in some of these channels, the Snohomish, it's, it's obviously other land uses, but even if they've stopped the, the timber harvest and the wood removal, again, there's this legacy where the channel is likely to be simplified and that the floodplain connectivity is lower for some time after that land use stops. And the third example, can't resist beavers, 
Uh, Beaver Wetlands in the Appalachians. This is not published, but I got this information from Art Parola at the University of Louisville. So notice the name of the creek. It's Slab Camp Creek. So obviously there was timber harvest here historically. The forest has regrown. It's been more than a century since this timber harvest, but this is what the creek looked like. And Art Parola saw those hydric soils in cut banks like I was showing for the site in Pennsylvania and said, well, it looks like there were more like riverine wetlands here in the past. And he proposed to do river restoration by recreating this uh, river wetland corridor of wet meadows and a channel. And he couldn't get credit for stream restoration in uh, this area in Kentucky because of this unfortunate dichotomy we have in how we manage wetlands versus rivers. And it was wetland restoration, not river restoration. So he couldn't count it as river restoration. And I'll return to that idea in a moment and some of the problems with that. They did the restoration anyway. And this is what another part of the uh, watershed looked like after they'd done the restoration. They found plant macrofossils in those organic rich buried layers that when they were exposed were still viable and they regenerated. And they also uh, did active replanting of wetland plants. They reintroduced beaver who did very well. So they went back to something like this river wetland corridor. But the other issue when he started this was that people in the state said, no, you can't bring beaver back in here. There were never beaver. That, that, this wasn't the right environment. They were never here historically. And he could show stratigraphic evidence or sedimentary evidence that they were. So this was a perception issue. Like, no, no this, that's not the kind of river we ever had here. There's geologic evidence, and geologic in this sense, very recent, uh, just over a century ago, that in fact it was there. So those perception issues become really important in thinking about what's the potential for river restoration and what alternatives there are. Okay, so alternative states, I uh, mentioned this idea this morning. You can have direct or indirect human alterations that push a river corridor into a different configuration, different set of processes, and that can be very stable and self-sustaining unless there's something that pushes it back. But in many cases, what we push a river corridor into is more homogenous and there's lower levels of a variety of ecosystem services. Now I'm afraid to press it twice, but let's see, there we go. Again, the most common one I mentioned this morning, beaver meadow versus elk grassland. This is uh, from a site in Yellowstone when the beaver were present. Notice 1923, if you can't see the number, that's 1954, the white arrows indicating the same point. 2002, before wolf reintroduction and the return of some of this woody riparian vegetation and beaver, uh, it, it's a drier, simpler river corridor in the absence of beaver activity. Another example of alternative states that, that we've been working on in the Rockies, uh, you notice it's the same valley bottom configuration, but when you have that old growth or naturally disturbed forest, you can have a lot of wood reintroduction, particularly of big trees that create channel spanning log jams, facilitate the development of that multi-thread system, and that's very stable and self-sustaining. But if you take the forest and all the in-channel wood out, you're more likely to go to something that is a simpler system. And one of the things that we've done is to try and develop empirical thresholds for, well, how much wood do you need to create this? So, oh, shoot, sorry, um, see if we can go back. Sometimes there's a lag on this, or a very long lag. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think it's just starting to get slower at changing. And one more, please. There we go. Uh, if you, <laughs> all right, we don't have to look at it. It's okay. What, what the plot showed was the downstream spacing of ramp and bridge pieces that are more stable and nucleate log jams on the y axis. The x axis is wood load. And once in these particular channels, once you get those ramp and bridge pieces spaced at 20 meters or closer downstream, they're very effective at collecting wood creating channel spanning log jams that force that secondary channel pattern. So the point is, if you're interested in trying to kick a system into a different configuration, if you think it's been simplified, you can develop empirical thresholds by looking at less altered portions of the river corridor and looking at what happens there. The other thing I wanted to, to talk briefly about in terms of the science of river restoration is the idea of process domains. And actually I'll 
sorry, I've forgotten your name, but um, I was asked at lunch about what about the river continuum concept? Do most of you, are you familiar with that concept? Okay, it's the idea that there are uh, very pronounced downstream trends in channel width, primary productivity, different macroinvertebrate communities. And I once, I had a colleague who's an ecologist say, tell me that Robin Venotti, the lead author on that paper said to him, he wished he had never published that paper, which I think is really unfortunate, but it's because he's gotten so much pushback on the idea of continuous downstream trends. So the alternative conceptual model, and I think both of them are valid um, in different scenarios, is the idea of process domains, or it's sometimes called serial discontinuity. And instead of having continuous longitudinal trends, it's the idea that there are abrupt downstream changes when you change valley geometry or you change hydrologic regime, for example, if you have surface runoff coming in versus maybe a, a springhead farther upstream, that, so it's groundwater controlled. This is certainly uh, the case in most of the systems that I've worked in. They are discontinuous as you go downstream. You enter very distinct process domains. So just a hypothetical example, if you're looking at a mountainous catchment, you might have something like avalanches dominating the disturbance regime in the uppermost portions. And then debris flows a little bit farther down. Let's see what happens if I press this twice. There we go. Well, I got both of them. Um, debris flows, then you go farther down to a lower gradient portion of the network and it's overbank flooding or lateral channel migration that dominate. It's kind of a reach scale approach rather than assuming that there are continuous downstream trends. You're looking for longitudinal transitions in what controls the system. And I think that's very important in most channels, even outside of, or most river networks, even outside of mountainous regions. So part of understanding process domains is understanding the disturbance regime. And again, a, a disturbance is any fairly discrete event, a flood, a drought, a debris flow, a big blowdown or a tornado that changes from an ecological definition, changes community or population structure, resource availability. You know, the obvious example for a river would be a flood. The disturbance regime would be the distribution of those events in time and space. And part of the idea of understanding process domains is that maybe the, the physical geometry of the valley or the channel doesn't change that much, but the disturbance regime might change as you go through a river network. Um, so you have spatial changes in disturbance regime. Okay, uh, if you're looking at rivers, that's basically water, sediment, other materials. So it could be solutes, it could be particulate organic material or large wood. It, the disturbance regime reflects where those are coming from, how they are distributed through time and space. So things like magnitude and duration and the position of the river reach within the drainage basin. So are you in a headwaters or in a large lowland river? Briefly, an example from the Colorado Front Range, uh, you know, the three different colors here are representing some of these process domains. So the highest elevations, we have avalanches, perennial flow, snowmelt runoff, the peak flow is something like, sorry, I'm gonna say it in metric, 1.1 uh, cubic meters per second per square kilometer. It's pretty well behaved. You can predict the snowmelt runoff based on the snowpack. As you go down to lower elevations in Colorado, you have a much drier environment I never know how long to wait for the lag. Let's try it again. All right. Yeah, we'll get both. You go down to the lower elevations, it's drier. We have a much higher uh, return interval for wildfires. They generate debris flows. We also have really intense convective storms. So the peak discharge is more like 40 cubic meters per second per square kilometer. We get flash floods down there. And as you go to even lower elevations, it's so dry on the um, Great Plains, it's a steppe environment that the channels that head down there are ephemeral. So you know, it's, this isn't super relevant for Wisconsin, but the point is, as you move down the drainage network, there are distinct differences in disturbance regime and process domain. Here, it might be you're moving from an area where there's outwash or uh, some of the recessional moraines into an area where there's glacial lacustrine clays or differences in bedrock lithology. Another example, uh, so down on the plains, I mentioned this morning that natural systems are not static. They can be dynamically stable, but they change through time and space. We have a lot of rivers on the eastern plains in Colorado that flip back and forth over periods of a few decades between 
braided systems after a large convective flood, convective storm flood has occurred, and then much narrower meandering systems with cottonwood gallery forests. And they do this repeatedly. So it has nothing to do with anything we're doing. It's just meteorological variability within a fairly consistent climate. But understanding this type of flipping is very important for river restoration. There's a very famous paper that was published a couple decades ago on a project that was done in California. Uh, they created a beautiful sign-generated meandering curve, rip-wrapped it in place, spent a lot of money on that. And they hadn't looked back at aerial photos and realized that this channel repeatedly went back and forth between braided and meandering. So less than six months after the project was finished, they had a five-year recurrence interval flood, not a big flood, but it ripped the whole project out and it went back to braided. So having some understanding of that historical context in the process domain would have helped to think about what's appropriate for river restoration. So I assumed this morning everybody knew about the natural flow regime. Is there anyone who's never heard of that concept? And please don't be shy. Or is everybody familiar with that? It's the idea that the average annual hydrograph or the, the characteristic hydrograph really drives the river corridor. So magnitude, frequency, duration, seasonality of flow, and the rate at which the flow goes up and down. Those are the components that were emphasized. The idea is that that's the primary driver of river ecosystems. And in that original paper, which was 1997, they acknowledged that there were other drivers, but they didn't really address them. And one of them is sediment. So you can also talk about the natural sediment regime. It's much harder to quantify than the natural flow regime because if you go on USGS websites, uh, I don't know how many stream gauges there are. I'm gonna make up numbers that are proportional. Let's say there's 10,000 stream gauges in the continental US. There's probably about 10 that measure sediment. So it, we have very few sediment records compared to discharge records. But you can start to indirectly infer a sediment regime and a sediment budget. So, Either budget or regime, I'm using them interchangeably. It's what comes into and goes out of a reach of river and the storage. And schematically, it's, it's just very simple change in storage through time inputs minus outputs plus storage. But that's fairly challenging to quantify for a river because you have both upstream and lateral inputs from within the river corridor and outside of the river corridor, you have Lateral downstream outputs, lateral outputs, and then various forms of storage. So a lot of times this is done either with repeat surveys over a short time scale or with uh, something like measurement of sediment storage uh, changes over decadal time scales using sediment records, stratigraphic records in the floodplain or in the channel. You can talk about a natural sediment regime analogous to a natural flow regime as what was present in a river network or river corridor prior to a lot of alteration. So construction of dams that store sediment or alteration of the upland land cover that would change sediment inputs. Fundamentally though, a lot of this like the natural flow regime can be assessed by looking at the biological community. Uh, an example from near where I live, the, the Platte River historically was very broad, shallow, and braided, and it was critical stop, stopover habitat for migrating waterfowl, uh, whooping cranes, sandhill cranes, which I've been seeing here. It's been really fun. Uh, lots of other species and uh, a lot of fish as well. The river morphology has changed dramatically because of changes in sediment availability in the plat and the loss of peak flows. So a lot of what had been unvegetated sandbars, it was a braided system as Nelson talked about, it's now either a single thread or an anastomosing system. They're native riparian species, but they've completely stabilized the bars and it's pretty bad news for many of the migratory birds. So this, the sediment regime and water regime have changed and that's stress the biota. So it's just emphasizing this point that the ecosystem organization of the river and the adaptations of both aquatic and riparian species reflect the conditions that were maintained by a natural sediment regime. And again, that natural sediment regime isn't static. Uh, it, it varies through space and time. So trying to understand the natural range of variability is key. Well, 
for a natural flow regime, you can try and um, start to restore it, particularly in regulated systems by having things like experimental floods or environmental flow releases. It's harder for sediment. And in many cases, it's impossible to go back to a natural sediment regime. So one option is to try for a balanced sediment regime. So you're moving the sediment that comes in with the flow that's available to transport it and you're creating conditions that are favorable for the native biota. Here, you'd probably be focusing on spawning gravel for brook trout. So how much flow do you need to mobilize fine sediment that may be coming in, for example, as a result of land use? And again, in a management regime, it's, it's one that results in both what's supplied and what the desirable conditions are. The third portion of this is the natural wood regime. Obviously, it only applies to forested channels, but this is just a schematic illustration to make the point that there are process domains with respect to wood, too. So if you're in a steep, narrow headwaters, maybe most of the wood is coming from the adjacent hill slopes through mass movements like debris flows, and it may form a different type of deposit than you see lower in the catchment more where maybe the wood is coming from bank erosion. It's not that there's a particular amount of wood or, or spatial distribution of wood that's always appropriate. It, the point is you, you really have to think about the process domain you're in and you know, how does the wood get in here? Where would it be deposited? Where would it be beneficial for the biota we're trying to manage for or the channel morphology we're trying to manage for? So in the context of this meeting, where would it benefit brook trout the most? So I think of this as the, this triangle or tripod where it's flow regime, sediment regime, and wood regime, and thinking about how the interactions among these can maximize these particular outcomes that you'd like, whether it's connectivity or habitat. Okay, so moving into practice. When Ray asked me to give this talk, I thought, well, I'm not going to go through the whole history of, of river restoration and what is commonly done. I'm going to talk about what I see as being on the cutting edge. So for the smaller rivers, coming up with more natural grade control, if that's an issue. And this is an example from Italy. If you've ever been to the Alps or parts of Japan, it's just one concrete check dam after another. They're trying to stabilize the river and minimize downstream movement of sediment. Because of land use and settlement patterns in the river corridors, they do need grade control. But this is an example where they're using uh, naturally occurring boulders that have been in place with the same spacing and height that they see on natural step pool channels. So there's more fish passage. There's a little bit more sediment passage than you would see if you had concrete drop structures. So an example of more natural grade control. Naturalization, sometimes it's called renaturalization. There are actually a lot of words that are applied to it, but we're not going to see it. <laughs> All right, let me try again. Sorry, can you advance that one? Uh, I've got an example from Illinois where you have some of the same drainage canals on the floodplains that are used for agriculture that I know are, are common here. If the, the traditional practice was to create a checkerboard of these. They're very straight, uniform at right angles. If they're going to keep the corn and soybeans and some of the other crops they, they grow, they have to keep draining those floodplains, but they've either started to put in just a little bit of sinuosity or just not dredge them every year and allow a little bit of irregularity to develop. There's nothing like a natural system, but they're seeing some biotic response and a little bit more nutrient uptake when they allow a little bit more heterogeneity in there. So coming back to that idea that it's not either or, it's a continuum. If you have a little bit more heterogeneity, you get a little more response. Riparian buffers, I'm sure everybody in this room is very familiar with those, just making sure that the buffers are a little bit wider than I think it was, I'm forgetting who showed that photo this morning where there was one tree width of buffer. <laughs> a little bit wider than that helps a lot. Uh, and channel floodplain connectivity is something that's really emphasized in a lot of small to medium river restoration now, however that's achieved, and there are a lot of different ways to achieve it. For larger rivers, uh, in many cases, it's modifying the structures or the uh, flow regulation that's been in place in the past. So 
if you have levees and the floodplain is already um, undergoing intensive land use, whether it's crops or urbanization, can you move the levees back just a little bit or notch them in places and reconnect just a small portion of the floodplain? Maybe in some cases you can take them out entirely if you can acquire the land, if it's agricultural, for example. If there's a dam in place, can you get rid of it or can you change the operating system so that it's got a slightly more natural flow regime or it restores some components of the natural flow regime like the seasonal timing of the peak flow. If there are secondary channels that were removed and I know in this part of the world, many of them were disconnected for log floating. It, can you remove those barriers that were put in 100 years ago and allow some of those secondary channels to be hydrologically reconnected? Same thing with the floodplain. If there were structures put in, can you take those out that will reconnect parts of it? So some examples from, this is in Montana. These are uh, artificially created depressions and the, the secondary channels are natural, but they've removed barriers and they're reconnecting them. An example of notching a dam or again, removing barriers that had limited side channel connectivity. And a lot of this comes down to what's been called reconfiguration versus reconnection. Much of the small to medium sized river restoration that we've done in the past is reconfiguration. Let's take, I'll use Ray's phrase, let's, let's take the Tonka toys in or the heavy equipment and create the, the form we want and then stabilize it. That's self-defeating if it's a meandering channel. Uh, meanders are inherently mobile. They migrate towards the outside of the bend. So you're, you're recreating the form without the processes. Reconfiguration can be very appropriate if you're, for example, removing legacy sediment. Reconnection is more the idea that you're removing barriers as the form's already there, but it's not hydrologically connected or connected for sediment. Can you reconnect them? All right, there we go. So some of the, the newest conceptualizations and approaches, the idea of stream evolution model and what's called stage zero, the geomorphic grade line is related to that, and then the stream evolution triangle and the idea of biomic river restoration. Let's start with stage zero. I, how many of you have heard that term before? Okay, not that many. It's, it's something that's really coming from the Pacific Northwest, but it's starting to be used across the country now. It refers to this part of this stream evolution model. There have been stream evolution models since the 1970s. They were initially developed for channelized systems. And if you're not familiar with that, I think there was some of that here in Wisconsin, but you take a usually a naturally meandering channel, you cut it down and you make it straight to increase flood conveyance and flood control. That channel typically becomes extremely unstable and goes through a series of um, responses that were described by the channel evolution model. A few years ago, Clure and Thorne published this version to show adjustments through time. And they started with the assumption that the stage zero was the starting point for many channels. So it's, I was trying to get a red circle to come up, but it's just the idea that it's a multi-channel system with stable vegetated interflue. So something that's anastomosing. I wanna emphasize that not all channels should be stage zero or, or ever were under natural conditions, but they emphasize stage zero in this evolution model. And it's emphasized now in many river restoration projects because until very recently, no one ever considered this as something that is desirable to restore to because we're not used to seeing this type of channel. It's become much less common than it was historically or under natural conditions. Okay, there we go. Batteries may be wearing down in this. Um, yeah, I think I need help. It's not advancing. Thank you. So again, the, the image you saw this morning, just making the point that these multi-channeled rivers can occur at a variety of scales from first order channels up to very large lowland rivers. And I went on Google Earth to find an example from here in Wisconsin. So obviously a beaver modified example, but low gradient systems with multiple channels. And just a, a idealized drawing that we had some artists do of what this might look like on the landscape. And obviously whether you have Sedge meadows, willows, alders, something else depends on the specific location. But the, the point is that the stage zero idea is being increasingly promoted as part of these small to medium river restoration because of the 
pretty substantial habitats you can get from these very spatially heterogeneous systems, whether it's attenuation of water and sediment, uh, habitat, biodiversity, denitrification, et cetera. So how do you get to a stage zero? Now, there's, there's two basic approaches. If the, again, if the channel is disconnected from the floodplain hydrologically, you either raise the channel and put obstructions in it or you lower the floodplain. So raising the stream bed, uh, you know, usually that's done by obstructing the flow. So putting in a lot of large logs or allowing beaver to recolonize, putting in beaver dams. You could also really restore very dense uh, sedge meadow vegetation. That can impede flow and increase the stage or the height of the water as well for a given discharge. Or again, lowering the floodplain. And the geomorphic grade line is a method that Paul Powers, who's with the Forest Service in Oregon, developed, where you look at historic records and the sediment in the valley bottom to infer what the former floodplain level was like, and if necessary, lower the sediment in the floodplain by physical removal. So like the mill dam sediments in the Pennsylvania example, Two examples of this that have very nice story maps online. Deer Creek in Oregon is large wood addition on a massive scale undertaken by the Forest Service and Big Spring Run was the one I mentioned earlier. There we go. Uh, the, another example analogous to Deer Creek, this is the South Fork Mackenzie in uh, Oregon. Oh, wow, okay, we just went several ahead. Let's see if I can go back. Sorry, I may need help again. Okay, there we go. Uh, this is what it looked like pre-restoration, and these dots are the same as down here. Those were monitoring points. It was a single thread channel, hydrologically disconnected from the floodplain, not much salmon uh, activity or lamprey, which are the, the two types of aquatic species that the Forest Service is particularly concerned with here. This is, um, you know, sometimes people talk about, oh, I don't know, wicked problems or audacious solutions. This is an audacious project. They put thousands of big trees in here, knocked them over, brought them in by helicopter and created something that looks like this. And there's good historical evidence that this is what this system looked like. It's a very broad river wetland corridor now. And the Forest Service has been doing a lot of monitoring pre and post so they've seen more salmon reds, they've seen more Pacific lamprey reproduction. I've never seen biologists get so excited about tiny little worms. I was out there with them when they were seeing the lamprey. And I'll take your word for it, that's important. <laughs> but they were really excited. And right after the project was completed, they had the big fire in 2020 in this part of Oregon. You probably got smoke from it here. Most of the country did. This area did amazingly well. It was minimal burning in the floodplain because it's saturated and it's growing back really fast. So this is what it looks like on the ground. There's just a huge amount of wood that's been added here. None of this wood is cabled in place or in any way fixed. It's, there's a dam upstream, so they don't get big peak flows that is likely to mobilize these huge logs. And they've added so much wood that it's gonna interfere with the movement. If, if some of the logs get mobilized, they're probably just gonna form much larger log jams. And from some of the projects that they've done a series of these that were done five years ago, that's what they're seeing. The wood isn't going downstream and collecting on some bridge. It's forming these huge log jams that are really great for salmon habitat for creating nice spawning reds. The idea of the biomic river restoration and the restoration triangle that I had mentioned, this is coming from work by um, Colin Thorne and Janine Castro. The point they're making here is that when we do river restoration, we often focus on hydrology. You know, what's the flow we need to mobilize things? But in many systems, you have to pay at least equal attention to the sediment regime. So what's the geology doing in terms of the river corridor geometry and sediment inputs and the biology. What's going to happen in terms of riparian vegetation or in terms of beaver or large wood? And different types of channels are predominantly influenced by different processes or inputs that are showing on this triangle. So this is sometimes referred to as biomic river restoration. 10, or certainly 20 years ago, I think many of the physical scientists and engineers who were doing river restoration viewed it as a one-way interaction. You create the habitat template. It's called the field of dreams approach. Build it and they will come. If we create the physical habitat, the biota will just passively respond. 
Now there's much more of a recognition that it's a two-way interaction. You have to pay attention to what happens with the riparian or aquatic vegetation, for example, because that will influence that physical template that you're trying to create. Um, so just emphasizing, thinking about what I call drivers. What are those processes that influence that template and that disturbance regime? And this is a book I highly recommend to everyone. And I want to spend a minute on it because if, <laughs> if stream mitigation banking isn't part of your worldview, it, I can almost guarantee it will be. Uh, it's the idea, it's just like wetland mitigation banking. Some developer wants to alter a stream. Well, they'll buy credits by restoring a stream somewhere else. It's okay in theory. In practice, look at this, this river. It's a meandering river that's riprap. In practice, the primary criteria that's used for stream mitigation banking is channel stability. So as Ray was saying, you know, everybody thinks bank erosion is terrible. A little bit of bank erosion is absolutely critical in natural rivers. So if you use bank stability as the only criteria, and this is absolutely being done, you can take a pristine natural channel, develop it, kind of destroy it as an ecosystem, and you can go find another natural channel that happens to have some bank erosion, stabilize it by rip wrapping it, and you get mitigation credits. So there is absolutely net loss if it's applied that way. I don't know that any of us are gonna be able to influence legislators and, and how this is implemented, but the key is mitigation banking is really dangerous and destructive if channel st stability is the only criteria. And this book is written for non-specialists, the, the streams of revenue, but it lays out that history really nicely. This is coming out of North Carolina and there the only criteria is channel stability. So in terms of trends in river restoration, this is one to be aware of and watch out for. Another issue that, that many scientists have raised, and it's a difficult one to address, is this divergence between what's been done in the past and the scale at which we're restoring. And a nice uh, paper that addresses this, I, I love the title, The Fuzzy Logic. They're saying, how can we expect to reverse catchment scale degradation if we're doing little bits of restoration here and there? And this was in the context of nitrate. It's not an easy question to answer, but you know, I could, it, for those uh, catchments in this part of the world where maybe brook trout are gone or you want more brook trout, how much do you need to restore? 10% of the river network? 20%, 50%? I don't know. Uh, if it's nitrate, we don't know either. We, we don't have the predictive capability yet, but that is something to keep in mind when somebody says, we're gonna do restoration, great, but how much is gonna make a big difference? Presumably there's a cumulative effect and we get to some threshold that it will show up at the watershed scale, but we don't know what that is yet. Sorry, I think I need help again. <laughs> yeah, we can just go on. It was just highlighting that point. So this, this unfortunately, this is the last slide. So you could probably just stay there. I think it comes back to what I started the first talk with. A lot of this is driven by what people want and expect. And if you look up images of a river online, you get something that looks pretty, but it's very simple, it's very stable. And as river scientists, we, oh, geez, that really went all the way. So could you go back to the second to last? Yeah, that one. Um, real natural rivers are, let's see if I can do this. Yeah, dynamic and spatially heterogeneous, but a lot of people don't want that. Um, it's not as attractive, it's not as aesthetically pleasing, it's dangerous if you wanna take an inner tube down it or whatever the case may be. So I do think communication is critical. And there are lots of different ways to do that. This is a sign that was on a tree in a, a national forest in Montana that I saw two decades ago, but I think it's a nice example of just getting people to accept wood in streams as not something that needs to be cleaned out, but something that's beneficial. And that message is making it gradually into public consciousness. And I've got this movie poster up here because it's a nice example of how you communicate. Has anyone seen this movie? No, I, I'd recommend it. It's based on a true story. When Pinochet uh, decided to allow a free election he was leading in the polls. And if you know anything about Pinochet, he was a pretty nasty dictator who had a lot of people executed. And it's like, how, how could you choose to, to vote in this dictator? And 
he was the devil you know. And at the time, people were, you know, all the, the opponents were saying, oh, this guy is so terrible, this guy is so terrible, and it just wasn't working. So they hired an advertising company who's represented in the film by Gael Garcia Bernal to think about a different approach. And what they did was run all these ads saying, look how wonderful life could be under a different political leadership and Pinochet lost. So instead of saying bad, 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 they said, look at the alternative and how good it could be. So I think we can do a lot with that as scientists. There's abundant evidence that if you just say, don't do this, it doesn't work very well. Don't smoke, don't do this, don't do that. People do it anyway. But if you present a positive alternative uh, and that works for river restoration too, that may be a more effective way to communicate. So I think that's the last one, so thank you. We have time for questions. Okay. Oh. Thank you so much. Um, so, in in terms of um, the different techniques that you could be using, and more natural stream design, and less anchored and um, more braided channels that you've been talking about, do you see any limitations that you might face in the field? Are there any sort of political structures? Um, beyond that perspective that people might have. It's a little different. Yeah, so I think everybody could hear the question. Again, again, it, it comes. Oh, okay, let me, let me move over here. Okay, uh, it really comes down to that context. So <laughs> I hope I'm not gonna offend anyone by saying this, but if you have, um, people who are using the river for recreation in floating. If you have kayakers or even whitewater rafters versus tubers, there's a different level of ability to respond to obstacles like wood that's introduced to the river. Um, and I'm using that example because tubers usually don't have much control over their directionality of the boat. And they may have a lower skill level and they may be drunk, but um, it's mainly that they don't have paddles. And so if you've got a lot of tubing use on a river, and it, this is a big deal in the river that flows through the community I live in, you probably don't wanna put big log jams in there, or if, even if you've got skilled kayakers, you wanna put the log jams at a place where you've got signs upstream, people can see what's coming, they have a chance, there's an obvious point they can exit if they don't wanna paddle around the obstacle. Uh, that's one example. So, you know, some places you can put in lots of wood and it, you're not gonna hurt anybody. Other places you have to worry about, um, injury or death to people using the rivers. Some places if you're putting in wood and there is infrastructure downstream that could be damaged by that wood becoming mobilized, then you probably wanna figure out a way to anchor the wood. Uh, and anchoring could be something as simple as having a really huge tree with a root rod well above the high water mark, and then having only smaller pieces that are caught on that. Uh, if that's not an issue, is at that South Fork McKenzie site, leave the wood where it is and let it redistribute itself. So I think, being aware of both, um, let's say community resistance to certain types of restoration and, and respecting that, and being aware of the hazards that you might create to infrastructure or communities or recreational users is important. So the one thing I kept hearing about the last two days was the ability to cast a fly. Um, you know, certain types of river restoration that might encourage really dense riparian vegetation that would catch somebody's fly before it gets to the fish, Maybe that's something that's not appropriate in that setting. Yeah, Faith. Um. Um, uh, we, we, were, we hear a lot about floodplain reconnection um, and it's usually from the top up, like the surface up in terms of flood storage. Um, but I really like the slide that you had that showed the hyperreic zone going underneath the floodplain. Um, Currently, when floodplains are reconnected here, you see topsoil put in, you know, so you'll clear an area, make it low enough, and then just drape it with topsoil and then plant something in it. Um, do you see anything out your way where they're doing more with like what that floodplain soils and the stratigraphy and kind of the diversity of um, soils and well, sediment that would go along with, you know, an alluvial floodplain. Have you seen much that would take advantage of that? 
Yeah, most of the floodplain reconnection in Colorado, we, we didn't have mill dams. We didn't have a lot of um, upland clearing for agriculture in the, the areas with topography. So there, there's no legacy sediments on most of the floodplains unless they're toxic metal mining from the 19th century. So mostly the floodplain reconnection involves putting obstacles into the channel. And that can both raise the, the height of the water for a given discharge because it's moving more slowly. And the obstacles are usually beaver dam analogs or engineered log jams or natural wood. The other thing that you're doing is if you put an obstacle in the channel, you're creating that pressure gradient that promotes hyperic exchange both through the bed and through the banks. Um, so that was a partial answer to your question. I, I haven't seen, and, and all the sites I've been involved with in Oregon, they're just taking the sediment out. Um, there's plenty of organic rich sediment at depth. They're just re-exposing that. Sometimes they're letting it revegetate naturally. Sometimes they're replanting it, or at least um, jumpstarting it with something like willow plantings. Yeah the, yeah, the question was, has there been much monitoring of how the macro invertebrate community responds? Um, for the two that I was focusing on, so Big Spring Run and the Forest Service Projects in Oregon, yes. And the, you get different um, distribution of the different types, like grazers, shredders, filterers, et cetera. The abundance typically increases because you've got more lodic habitat uh, as you're going to a multi-channel system. And that was something I, I didn't mention this morning when I was talking about that Leaky Rivers project where we looked at large wood. We didn't see any more aquatic insects per unit area of channel, but when you go to a multi-channel system, there's more total area of channel. So there's more macroinvertebrates per unit length of valley. So that's, they, they found that in the Oregon and, and Pennsylvania projects. You've got a greater diversity of the different functional groups because there's more habitat diversity. And you typically have greater abundance per unit length of valley because there's more stream environment. And I, I should say that in both cases, I think they've found, of course, that the macroinvertebrates are very unhappy at the initial disturbance, but they come back with, or they, they start to diversify and increase in abundance within one summer season at each site. Thank you very much, Elma. Thank you.